The PS1 might just be my favorite console of all time. I'm sure it's mostly nostalgia speaking, but that mid-90s aesthetic, those beautifully blocky, pixelated polygons just butters my muffin, if you know what I mean. Oh, wait, wrong footage. While the PS1 in retrospect feels like an early adopter of CD technology, game consoles were experimenting with CD-ROM as early as 1988 and continued throughout the early 90s. And the ultimate in radical technology, TurboGrafx CD. Hey, you still don't have a Sega CD? Huh? At the times of those super early CD-based systems, writing your own CDs was very much out of reach for piracy groups and definitely the average consumer. It's for this reason that systems like the Sega CD, the Philips CDI, and the everyone 3DO have no copy protection on their CDs whatsoever. But by the mid-90s, affordable CDRW drives were on the horizon. Suddenly, burning wasn't just what you did with Dave Matthews Band CDs. With burners just starting to sneak in under the $1,000 mark, it wouldn't be long until the average consumer could trivially make an illegal copy of a game. With this in mind, both Sony and Sega with their upcoming CD-based systems knew they would need protection against inevitable CD piracy. The Sega Saturn is a story for a whole other video. Let me know in the comments if you want to see that. In addition to copy protection, they would also want a much more annoying form of DRM alongside it, region locking. Or as I like to call it, racism. Region locking has been a part of gaming as early as the Nintendo Entertainment System. I have a whole video on that that you guys can check out here. Sony naturally wanted to implement these as securely as possible, and ultimately came up with a pretty clever way to do both at the same time. By taking advantage of the factory mastering process, they were able to write data to an area that an ordinary CD writer never could. They could then design the PlayStation to read this area as part of the boot process. That famous beep sound you hear on startup? Is the PS1 doing just that? And the data that Sony wrote there, on every PS1 disc, was a four-letter code that corresponded to the game's intended region. As a PS1 read this data, it would compare it to its own four-letter code that was hard-coded into its BIOS. If it matched, the PS1 knew that not only was the game legitimate, it was also the correct region, meaning the disc could be booted. If not, the CD was either a bootleg or the wrong region, and the PS1 would refuse to boot it. Sony also claimed the famous black coating on their discs was part of their copy protection scheme too, as seen in this video from PlayStation Underground magazine. Black ink is added to the plastic to give the CD its distinctive, cool, PlayStation-only look. This also helps protect the CD from illegal copying. In reality, CD drives almost never had trouble reading through the black coating. Some claim they were simply trying to throw people off the scent. Or perhaps they meant copy protection in the same vein as those holographic Windows discs. Purely cosmetic, but extremely hard to replicate outside of the factory, and therefore a clear way to tell whether a copy is genuine or not. Either way, the copy protection really just boiled down to that four-letter code, which, while simple, is in all honesty extremely effective. To this day, it's still considered impossible to duplicate that four-letter code with any conventional CD burner. Which brings us to our next logical step. If you can't burn CDs that'll play on the PlayStation, can you make the PlayStation play burned CDs? The downside of such an easy-to-understand lockout system is that it's not hard to think of ways to circumvent it. Knowing that all the PS1 cares about is getting the correct four-letter code from the disc, if we can somehow just give it that code every single time, we can effectively defeat the copy protection and region locks altogether, which is precisely what a PS1 mod chip does. By injecting the correct code into the CD read stream, we can essentially trick the PS1 into thinking that code was read off the disc, regardless of what the CD drive actually read. Easy, right? Well, yes, so easy in fact, it's not uncommon to buy a secondhand PS1 that's already been mod chipped. Sony, aware of the rampant mod chipping, tried to implement mod chip detection in blockbuster games like Dino Crisis and Spyro Year of the Dragon. But hackers responded by making stealth mod chips that disabled themselves after the game boots, essentially making them undetectable once the game has started. Sony learned their lesson and made the security in the PS2 far more complex. Once again, maybe for another video sometime. So if we want to mod chip this PS1, where will we get our mod chip from? Usually, console mod chips are fairly complex and have to be printed by legit PCB manufacturers. But not this one! All we need is an 8-pin programmable pick chip like this, which legit only cost about a dollar or two in most places. These pins can be wired directly into the board with no other components, and just like that, the protection is completely defeated. Now, this is a DIY mod chip, but we're not actually going to be writing any code, because for the most part, that's already been done for us. 
Turns out, one of the best PS1 mod chips, the Multimode 3, is pretty much open source and has been ported to a variety of pick chips just like this one. There's also PS1 mod chip code for the Arduino called the PS Knee, which seems pretty cool, but for this video I'll be sticking with the old school pick method. Multimode 3 works on almost all systems and is a stealth mod chip, meaning it bypasses all mod chip detection routines. What else could you ask for? All we need to do is write this to a pick and we should be good to go. The original Multimode 3 uses a PIC 12F508, which is easy enough to find. I'm actually using the slightly different PIC 12F683, which requires slight tweaks to the PIC code, but other than that it's identical and all the steps will be the same. Next we just need a PIC programmer to write the code onto the chip. Here's a fairly simple one that'll do the job, and you should be able to pretty much use anything that can program PICs. Obviously, getting the console region correct is very important, and since I'll be modding a PAL PS1, I'll be using the SCEE region code for Europe. Alright, ready to go, and we're off! And that's it! I'll run a quick verify just to be sure, but otherwise we've already finished making our mod chip. Excellent! Now I just gotta get it out. This can often be kind of a tedious process because you don't want to bend any of the pins. I tend to just lever it up a little bit on each side until eventually it pops out. Now it's time to bust open the PS1 and get this thing soldered in. While this is happening, I should mention that mod chipping may or may not be legal depending on where you live. Where I live, in Australia, it actually is legal since courts in 2005 concluded that while a mod chip could facilitate copy infringement, it is not in itself copy infringement. Not as much as actually making the copy in the first place. If you're mod chipping for homebrew or circumventing region locks, there's no issue at all in the eyes of the law. But those are the laws here and won't necessarily apply to those living outside of Australia, so if you're interested in doing this but are concerned about the legality, you should probably check the laws of your area. Now I didn't go into much detail about the disassembly, and that's because it's really pretty straightforward, but also because there were several hardware revisions of the PS1, and chances are this one won't exactly match yours, so if you're not sure, you should look up disassembly instructions for your specific SCPH model. And this applies to the mod chip solder points as well. For example, the last PS1 I modded, an SCPH7502, had many of the solder points underneath this metal plate, which is soldered onto the board and a pain in the ass to desolder and remove. I'm not gonna lie, I was getting a little weary seeing this metal plate again on this model, SCPH5552, but as it turns out, none of the solder points are anywhere near this shield. In fact, they're all on the back, which actually is gonna make this way easier. The first thing I need to do is decide where I want the mod chip to go. It's good to do this first so you know exactly how much wire you'll need. Since I'll be mounting underneath the board, I also need to make sure there's enough space between the board and the plate underneath. Nowhere near any of these raised bumps where the screws go. I reckon here should be A-OK. -okay. I'll keep it in place with blue tack for now. We'll need to solder 7 of the 8 pins, and I'm going to solder directly to the pins on the chip. I don't always recommend doing this since a lot can go wrong. You can accidentally solder two pins together or risk damaging the chip if it gets too hot. Also if the write process failed earlier this makes it a lot harder to put it back in the programmer for debugging. But since I've done this before and I also verified the code writing, I'm pretty confident about this working and not needing to desolder it at some point or anything. Okay, that looks good. All that's left is to test it and I'll put some tape over to prevent any of the pins from shorting with the metal shielding. First the smoke test, just making sure I didn't break anything. Okay, good. It's always a relief to know I haven't irreparably damaged anything. Okay, now a genuine game to make sure the CD mechanism still reads correctly. Once again, good. Everything seems fine. Now it's time for the big test, a backup of the same game on an ordinary CDR. Oh yes, it works. This PS1 is officially mod chipped, playing games perfectly from a CDR. As I mentioned before, we can also play games from different regions. This is a US region game, and note how the startup says Sony Computer Entertainment America, but the code underneath still says SCEE. -E. This is because the text is actually from the game itself, and will thus match whatever region that the game is, while the four letter code, as we've established, is generated by the mod chip and always has to match the console. The boot text and logo can actually be changed to pretty much anything which some hacker groups would do to promote themselves. The later PS1 Slim models actually check the code and the text, making it harder to play imports or any pirated games with custom boot text. There's a different pick-based mod chip called the One Chip, designed specifically for the Slim PS1 to get around that text check as well. 
And finally, let's play some homebrew. There's actually a thriving PS1 homebrew community on psxdev.net, where people in the community continue to make games for the PS1. This game is called Yopaz Ice Star. You've probably played a puzzle game like it in the past. You're trying to collect all the stars, but can only move in one direction at a time. I.e. you can't stop or change directions until you hit a wall, so the puzzle is trying to navigate the environment to get all the stars without getting stuck anywhere. It's actually pretty good, and the advanced levels have a surprising amount of depth to them. I also like the atmospheric music. It kind of reminds me of the Portal soundtrack, and really helps give this game a cool space feel. I can even forgive the cheesy voiceovers when you complete a level. Unbelievable. Quite amazing. And we couldn't talk about homebrew without talking about emulators. Yes, even the PS1 has emulators. This one's called It Might Be NES and actually comes with a Windows tool to automatically create the ISO from a folder of NES ROMs. Now we'll boot into it. All good. Now, not gonna lie, the menu interface is a little weird. Pressing any of the action buttons just seems to jump you all around the menu, but the important things you need to know are D-pad to choose the game, start to actually start it. <laughs> And you know, it's actually pretty damn good. I know the NES is simple, but it's surreal to be playing these games on a PS1. Fun fact, as a testament to the simplicity of the NES, the PS1 CPU is actually not powerful enough to play an MP3 file in real time. But as we can see, it is still powerful enough to emulate an NES. Yup. The only downside is it doesn't seem to have a way to select PAL 60 or NTSC over PAL, meaning a PAL console like mine ends up playing games at 50Hz instead of 60. Even picking USA on the build tool doesn't seem to make a difference, but playing in an NTSC PS1 emulator, yes, an emulator in an emulator, shows normal speed, so I guess it's just kind of a bummer for PAL systems. I think the PS1 is super cool and love breathing new life into them with a quick mod chip. However, these systems are getting old, up to 25 years old in fact, and as they get older their drives will wear out and eventually die. So while this is a cheap and fairly easy thing to do, at the end of the day continuing to rely on these 25 year old CD mechanisms may not be the best idea. Of course there are super accurate emulators like Zebra and Mednafen for recreating the PS1 look and feel, but I also recommend taking a look at PSIO, a cartridge that plugs into the parallel I.O. port on the back of the PlayStation, and lets you boot disk images from an SD card, basically an EverDrive for PS1s. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, and keep in mind the PSIO is significantly more expensive than this mod chip approach, but it's a really cool project and again, I love to see people breathing more life into this old timer. Anyway, that's it from me, thanks for watching and enjoy your 90s nostalgia. Um,